Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me for R. Kelly Appeal TV Solar Coaster Segment 24, podcast number six. We're going to go right into the reading, and this will be the um, end of the reading for the week, and I will begin uploading again on Monday, and I believe Monday will be the... Um, that will be the seventh podcast segment um, on the 28th of February. So let's get right on into the concepts of Diary of Me, Solar Coaster, R. Kelly. We're going to talk about Willie Pearl. He don't sing like no boy. Robert sings like a man, said Willie Pearl. In my book, Willie Pearl gets her own chapter. I want to pay her tribute, and though she's long gone, I want to tell the world how her spirit entered my soul and helped give me the confidence I have today. I owe her so much. Willie Pearl was my mom's best friend when we lived in the Vista Gardens apartments. Willie Pearl and her two boys, Bam and Wolf, stayed right upstairs above us. The woman had her problems, but she was always managed, but she always managed to work and feed her sons. She always kept up appearances. When Willie Pearl came downstairs and showed up at our door, we got happy in a hurry. Her hair was always done up right, her clothes were fashionable and bright, and her smile could cut through anyone's sadness. In our poor neighborhood, she was the first one to buy her kids one of those toy casino keyboards. Soon as I saw that flimsy little thing, I started blending to the play. It called to me. Hey, Joanne, said Willie Pearl. Look how your boy is eyeing, eyeing that instrument. Think he can play it? I believe he can, Mom said. Well, let him try. I put my fingers all over the Casio. I wanted to be one of those guys who could sit down and play whatever was on the radio, but I couldn't. With two or three fingers, I could fool around baby chords. I heard simple melodies in my head, and those were the only ones I could manage to play on this toy keyboard. I started into the songs called Orphanage, about a little boy who lost his mother and father. The story flowed out of me. I didn't try for it. Um... It was just there. I found the right notes on the Casio and the right words to tell my little tale. Good God Almighty, Willie Pearl exclaimed. Your boy can sing, Joanne. Your boy can really sing. Where'd you he learn that song, Rob? Just made it up? No, you didn't. Oh, yes, he did, my mother said. Rob has a mind for making up music. That's beautiful, said Willie Pearl. I believe he's blessed. Y'all keep this uh, Casio down here. My boys don't care nothing about it, but your Rob, well, he's got a thing for it. Rob will use it. You mean that? I asked Willie Pearl. Indeed I do, child. Now you go on and write some songs. Write one for your mama. Next day when Pearl came over, I had a new song ready. What is it called, son? She said. Hard times, I said. And it's for my mama. Yes, Mama, it's all about Mom. Hard Times was a simple melody in a deep blues bag. When I started singing, I could see that I tapped a main vein. I could see it in Willie Pearl's eyes, which were wet with tears. Hard Times, I sang. She worked night and day. Hard Times just to keep the landlord away. Hard Times, she does it all alone. Hard Times, her love keeps us strong. Sing it again, son, Willie Pearl requested. I sang it again, and before I knew it, the women was calling every last person living in Vista Gardens to come over and hear me sing about these hard times. He don't sing like no boy, said Willie Pearl. Robert sings like a man. She was showing me off like I was her own son. After that, many were the times Willie Pearl would come over just to hear me sing. Some of those times I could see that she was flying high in a friendly sky. Other times she was sober as a church mouse. But every time she made me feel special in her loving way, she let me know that my songs lifted a heavy burden off her shoulders. It's a powerful feeling that I still cherish to this day, knowing that something I created can lift burdens and lighten loads. 
As Willie Pearl closed her eyes and sat back with a sweet smile on her face, I let new melodies come to my fingers and new stories come to my lips. Willie Pearl, this beautiful woman who let me use this little Casio, inspired me to create. You touch my soul, boy, she said. You touch my heart. Her words of encouragement fueled my reaching so, um, some of my highest solar coaster moments. Ah, finally, a good little segment. <laughs> I was smiling at the moment. I was frowning. I was feeling funny about the whole thing. I knew I had gotten a pass. I knew I hadn't earned this diploma. Hooping ahead. <clears throat> My hoop skills got me on my elementary school basketball team. Our team did really well and the school was proud of us. As a result, I had some positive energy moving through me. Basketball was a way for me to feel good about myself. Our coach, Mr. Wright, was a smart and honest man. When it came to ball, coach was all business. He demanded the best from you. He was firm but fair. I wasn't the greatest player in the world, but I had a great desire to win. My hard work, my hustle. Coach saw my desire and encouraged it. He knew how bad I wanted to win. I respected his attitude and he respected mine. He, st he started me as a forward. My jump shot might have looked a little funny, but it, was, but it was falling. I was reading the defense, forcing turnovers, cashing in on fast breaks. The basketball court was where I, sh where I shined. The basketball court was never the problem. The problem was the classroom. Because of my reading, I kept falling further behind. I had ways of covering it up, skipping classes, pretending I lost my book, but I knew that one day it would catch up to me, and it did. I was held back a few grades, but because of basketball, I was allowed to slide at school. This reading problem hurt my heart so bad because of how I longed to know what was in those books. I had a desire for learning. I had an imagination that drew me to stories. When I looked through picture books, for instance, the pictures seemed to be waving at me. If our class took a field trip to a museum, I became part of the paintings on the wall. If there was a picture of a man on a boat in the middle of the sea, I'd make up a story in my mind. The man had dreamed of an enchanted island where a princess was waiting for him. She was the love of his life and he was sailing all the way around the world to find her. I felt like a bird without wings. I had the desire to fly, but just couldn't do it. I had the desire to read stories, but just didn't know how. To me, stories were the most beautiful things in the world. I'm in love with hearing a good story. When our class went to see The Black Stallion, the story jumped off the screen into my soul. The movie was so powerful and inspiring to me. A boy and a horse surviving a shipwreck, stranded together on a desert island. After they were rescued, they achieved the impossible. The Black Stallion made me believe that I could survive my struggles, that I could overcome the obstacles in my life. Things that I didn't think I could ever do, I believed now that I could. We also saw Star Wars. That movie touched me too. I could relate to Luke Skywalker overcoming Darth Vader. I understood what the Force was about. From that day on, I wanted to believe the Force was with me and would get me through those dark days at school. During my last year of elementary school, nothing could stop our basketball team. We buried the rest of the league and we wound up undefeated champs. But I also couldn't be any sadder because there was no way I could graduate with the rest of the team. I had too many Fs. My failures had caught up with me. I was going to be held back in elementary school while the rest of the guys would move on to high school. Then came the news. A teacher called me into her office and said it plainly. You'll be graduating with everyone else. I couldn't believe it. I thought she had me confused with another student. I even asked her to repeat it. It's no mistake, Robert, she said. You will be graduating. We all know that you have a strong desire to win. You've proven that in basketball. So we're hoping that when you get to high school, you'll show that desire in the classroom. But you must realize that high school won't be... Um, won't fool with you. If you don't try harder and make passing grades, high school will kick you out. I thanked her and left, but her words hung heavy over my head. Her words were echoing inside my brain when a week later, my mother and I went to my elementary school graduation. 
I was smiling at the same time I was frowning. I was feeling funny about the whole thing. I knew I had gotten a pass. I knew I hadn't earned this diploma. All the families were there, everyone happy and proud, aunts and uncles, cousins and grandmas, crowding around the graduates, taking pictures, congratulating, hugging, wishing them well. As they called out the names of my classmates, I was flashing on all the games we won, the points I scored, the plays I made, the championship, the trophy, the pride that came with victory. I also remembered how the other kids learned to write and read while I couldn't. Flashing on all those times when staring at words on a page, my eyes went bleary and my mind went blank. Flashing on how it felt to get all F's in my heart, I knew that I didn't deserve the diploma. The feeling haunted me, and I felt like I was living a waking nightmare. When the principal called out our names, each of us got up to get a handshake and a certificate. Terrence Smith. Terrence got up and hurried across the stage when he was handed his diploma. Larry Washington. Larry walked over to get his diploma. <clears throat> I saw the faces of my fellow classmates and their families. Everyone was filled with pride except me. I was filled with shame, so much shame that when they called my name, I walked across the stage, took the diploma, threw it into the audience, and ran out of the auditorium. My mother ran after me. We were out in the parking lot when she said, what's wrong, son? I don't deserve it, I said. I didn't earn it. I want to be able to say, this is mine. I earned this. Then nobody can ever take it away from me. The day will come when you will find that you did earn it, Rob. You just got to be patient. Whew. Room 126. I remember there were 40 or 50 kids in the classroom. Everyone seemed to be old friends. I didn't know a soul. I took a seat in the first row and thought to myself, what the hell am I doing in here? I felt like an alien. Kenwood Academy, situated in the same Hyde Park neighborhood as the world-famous University of Chicago, where President Barack Obama and his wife Michelle once lived, was considered a great high school that attracted the smartest students, kids who wound up going off to all the best colleges. I got to go there, not because I was smart, but because I played basketball. I was happy for the chance to keep playing with my teammates and to move up to a higher league. I was totally blinded by my past and I couldn't see into the future. In my fantasy, I had a shot at the NBA. I felt good about basketball, but I didn't feel good about high school because I knew eventually everyone would find out that I couldn't read. I was afraid that I'd lose my shot at pro basketball and my dreams of a better life. I couldn't go back to grammar school and I didn't know how I was gonna get through high school. I was trapped. I never have t I never have teachers like in grade school who keep passing me. Besides, I didn't want that. I wanted to learn to read like everyone else. On my first day at Kimwood, I went to music class held in room 126. I didn't know what to expect. I remember there were 40 or 50 kids in the classroom. Everyone except me seemed to be old friends. I didn't know a soul. I took a seat in the front row and thought to myself, what the hell am I doing in here? I felt like an alien. Then the teacher arrived. The minute she stepped into the room, all talking stopped. Her hair was stylishly done. I saw from how she dressed that she had class. Her eyes were dark brown. Her eyes were looking over the room, seeing who's who and what's what. Her eyes told me that she was no substitute teacher. This lady wasn't playing. Her name was Miss Lena McClinn. She said, there are two students in here with gum in your mouths. I'm going to give them two seconds to put the gum in the garbage or I'll fail them. Right away, 20 students got up and put their gum in the trash can. I saw that this lady was smart. If she said, said six seconds, they would have they would had time to think about it. And maybe only five or six kids would have gotten up. She could sure take charge of a classroom. Next thing I knew, she was pointing right at me. I got scared and checked to see if I was chewing gum. I wasn't. I didn't know what she wanted from me. Do you know who you are? Yes, ma'am. I'm Robert Kelly. No, you are God's child. The spirit of God is on you, son. You are going to be famous. You are going to write songs for Michael Jackson. You are going to travel the world. People will pay to see you. You are anointed. God has given you a gift that no one can take away. I had never met this lady before and she had never met me. I didn't have a clue as to what she was talking about. I had her, I had her prophesy stuff. I heard her 
prophesy stuff before, but never about me. Besides, I wasn't into prophecies. I didn't believe them. Even in my mother's church, I was always um, too shy to jump up and start hollering. I never did catch the Holy Ghost. Now here at school, this teacher was talking in tongues and I was confessed as I could be. I love music, sure, but my main plan in life was to play basketball. Meanwhile, Miss McLean kept on talking, even as she walked over to the upright piano and sat down. She began playing gospel chords, which seemed weird to me. I'd never seen a teacher play gospel songs. At the time, I didn't know what she it, that she was a pastor as well as a teacher. I didn't know anything. All I knew was that Miss McLean was lifting her hand with her fingers spread apart and prophesying on my life like a preacher. While she was playing, she was praying, praise God, praise his holy name, praise him for giving this child a talent to the world that the world will recognize. Praise him for putting this boy in my classroom where he can grow. Lord, let him grow. Keep him strong. Then she looked over at me and said, stand up, boy. I want you to sing. I'm not a, really a singer. I said, I'm a basketball player. Son, you're not a basketball player anymore. You're singing today. Just follow me. She started singing Billy Preston's You Are So Beautiful to Me. I followed her and sang the same songs, the same notes. I was so shy, though, that I wouldn't face the class. I just faced her. Her face, bright and smiling, gave me confidence. Her voice inspired my soul. I started thinking, singing stuff that was amazing, even to me. Something clicked in me. I didn't know exactly what. I started flying. The weirdest sensation came all over me. I was able to sing lower than I ever had. I was able to go higher. New ideas popped off in my head and I could sing them all. The girls in the class were going crazy and the guys were giving me the woo 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 dog cheer. Um, I was a new person. This woman was taking me someplace I'd never been before. I had a new lease on life. Part of it had to do with the girls in high school. If you were light skinned or could sing a little, it was a rap. It wasn't light skinned, but having heard my, me sing a little, the girls were showing me serious love. That was enough to make my day, but not enough to make me change my mind. I still wanted to be Michael Jordan. Next day, I was at basketball practice when I saw Miss McLean and um, McLean coming around to talk to my new coach. No one had to. No one had told him about my reading problem, so he thought I was like everyone else. Do you have a Robert Kelly? She asked. Yes. Call him over here, please. Coach called me over. I stood in front of both of them. I want Robert off the team, said Miss McLean. He is a good player, said the coach. Don't matter to me how good he is. His music comes first. Robert must be focused. Basketball is a distraction, but he loves it. I realize that, but if he plays ball and does music, he'll wind up diluting them both. He's going to have to choose, but shouldn't that be his choice, the coach said? God has already made the choice, Miss McClinn explained. God has given this boy a precious gift, and I wouldn't want to defy God's will, would you? I had some thoughts about Miss McClinn's attitude. Music was cool, but hoop was still my heart. I couldn't give up hoop. You aren't giving it up, she explained. You're just giving up your place on the team. Basketball is good recreation, and I'm sure you'll be playing it for the rest of your life. But I need to. You need to listen to me, young man. You need to be in this music class every single day. I expect you to arrive early and leave late. I expect you to work twice as hard as any of your other students. Why? Because you're twice as talented. One day your records will be bought by millions. One day your songs will be played all over the world. I was asking myself, how is that possible? That's just a crazy lady talking crazy talk. You think this is crazy talk, Miss McClan said, as if reading my mind. But you can ask anyone in the school and they'll tell you that I am not a crazy woman. I am a serious woman. I am a God-fearing woman. I am a trained musician, personally trained by my uncle, Thomas Dorsey. Have you ever heard of Thomas A. Dorsey, Robert? No, ma'am. Thomas A. Dorsey was a genius. They call him the father of gospel music. He started out playing piano for the famous blues singer Ma, Ma Rainey in the 20s. You need to study these things, Robert. This is your heritage. My uncle used to go by the name Georgia Tom. In 1928, he wrote a song and recorded it with Tampa Red called Tight Like That. That sold millions of copies. Then in the 30s, his wife died, giving birth to his son. The baby also died. My uncle was so grief struck in that he wrote a song called Precious Lord, Take My Hand. 
I know that song. I said, my mom sing it. Everyone sings it. Aretha Franklin sang it. Dr. Ed sang it at Dr. King's funeral. Before that, Mahalia Jackson sang it. I know you've heard of Mahalia Jackson. She sang here in Chicago. Mahalia got famous singing my uncle's song, like Peace in the Valley, when Uncle Thomas went from writing blues songs to gospel songs, though some people didn't like them. I'm talking about church people. They thought his church songs sounded bluesy and jazzy. Well, they did. But Uncle Thomas knew that there's no sin in writing a song with jazz chords, no sin in putting blues feeling into God's music because all music is God's music. You must understand, Robert, that Uncle Thomas invented modern gospel because he wasn't listening to anyone except God. He knew that God wanted his message sent out to the world. And if a jazzy feeling or a bluesy feeling made God's message more appealing, then so be it. Uncle Thomas taught me to play piano, to write music, and to recognize genius. He had genius, Robert, and I see genius in you. I still have to come early and leave late every day, every single day. Not only that, but I'm going to teach you more than popular singing and gospel singing. I'm going to teach you opera. Opera, that's right. I'm going to teach you the most difficult singing there is. The more styles you learn, the better you'll be. I wanted to complain. I wanted to say that I still wanted to be on the basketball team. I wanted to refuse to come early and leave late every day. And I wanted to reject all this hard work she was talking about. But I didn't open my mouth for one simple reason. The lady intimidated me. <laughs> I love Miss McClan. I love her because I could feel that she loved God. She loved music and she loved me. She was strong, but it was but I was used to strong women. My mother was strong. Miss McClan couldn't sing like mom. She didn't have mom's powerful voice, but she could teach me things my mother couldn't. Miss McClan knew about breathing. She taught me to breathe deep from my diaphragm. Shallow breathing leads to shallow singing, she said, and you aren't a shallow singer, Robert. You're a singer who must sing from your soul. When Miss McClan gave me a song where the notes were too high for me to reach, she said, lift your eyebrows when you sing. I lifted my eyebrows and hit the notes. Then when the notes got higher and I complained I couldn't hit them, she said, think of a jet plane soaring through the clouds. Think of the highest, tallest things that you've ever imagined. I thought of the jet and the Sears Tower and hit the notes. But then when the notes got ridiculously high and there was no way to in the world I could sing them, she pressed my stomach real hard. I hit the notes. This was a technique that I still use to this day. That's how I hit those notes when a woman's when a woman loves by thinking about jet song, jet planes, the Sears Tower and the sun and the stars. Miss McLean gave me a song called Amadel Cure, the first love song. She said it was written in Italian 400 years ago. I couldn't sing a song that old. I said I can't sing a song written in Italian, but I did. Miss McLean showed me that I could sing anything. Miss McLean said I could write an area. So I created an area. Miss McLean said I could create a gospel song, a love song, a dance song. So I created them my way, all this in the same afternoon. She told me that she had written canta cantatas, masses, orchestral works for piano and violin. She'd even written electronic music. If I can do it, Robert, she said, you can. Miss McLean was college trained. She went to Spelman in Atlanta and then earned a master's degree in music from the American Conservatory in Chicago. Whatever melodies I have inside me, she said, you have even more inside you. Those melodies in you are limitless because they're coming from a limitless God. Our job is to praise him through music. As long as you keep praising him, he's going to keep blessing you. I got to the point that if Miss McClinn told me that I could jump off the Sears Tower and fly over Lake Michigan, I'd be jumping and flying. When it came to music, Miss McClinn did wonders for my confidence. When it came to reading, though, I was still sunk. At one point, my reading was so shamefully bad that I stopped going to class altogether. I couldn't take the pressure. I ran to the music room instead, but even there, I ran into trouble. There was this guy called Charles Craig. He was a Herbie Can Hancock fan, a wizard of the keyboard, and another protege of Miss McClinn. Not only could Charles um, play great, he could also write great. 
gospel, jazz, blues, pop, classical, the whole nine yards. Meanwhile, I couldn't play an instrument or read or write a single note of music. I didn't know the sharps from the flats. When I looked at a musical score, I got a headache. I did everything by ear. Being around Charles was Charles was a little intimidating, but I saw how much Miss McClinn admired him, and it made me want to learn piano. By watching him, though, I also learned something. He was a bad little guy, but when he read from the sheet music and played it flawlessly, it sounded cold. It didn't feel good. On the other hand, when he loose and just improvised, it felt great. I wanted to play in a way that felt great. Miss McClinn always talked about following that good feeling wherever it leads. When I found this secret room at school that everyone seemed to have forgotten about, it became another place, a safe place where I could escape from my classes in the world, and there was a piano in it. So I'm going to leave off right here. I had to finish that chapter. Um, next Monday, we'll be reading Ribbon in the Sky. Um, you know, um, sometimes, you know, the life that we live is so connected to everything that goes on with our lives, the people we meet, how we interact with them. And it's amazing. What are your comments about the way the teachers did him in elementary school? Do you think that they did him a, a justice or an injustice by pushing him through the um, educational system? Because that right there was a stepping stone into, again, that entitlement, that sense of ego, that sense of entitlement. And I think that if we, if there was just one responsible person in his life at this time, from kindergarten to sixth grade, he would have been on point. He would have been more morally would have been more morally correct. He would have been more um, intellectual because his self-confidence would have been built by him trying. If there was just one person in his life that knew how to read, write, um, I wonder why him and Lizette didn't, you know, uh, communicate on that level since she was a good writer. Um, it seems to me like there were people in his path that could have helped him had he not have had such a strong ego. But that was because he was around all those energies that just encompassed that negative vibration to where you don't say anything. You are you keep things quiet. You you throw your rock and hide your hands. You know, those type of 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 perspectives did not do him any justice. So give me some of your comments um, below about this. I'm going to let the algorithms of YouTube catch up with these videos because I've shot out five videos this week and I only do a video a week. So, but I want to get through this um, book through his autobiography because I, it's time to start talking about the um, appeal. I see some things happening. I'm just doing research. Nothing really strong to report, you know, but it, but the, uh, the, um, the motion is being looked at at this point. So I thank you so much for liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing on the podcast. And I hope you are enjoying yourself. And if you're not enjoying yourself, let me know how I can better the um podcast for the solar coaster. All right. Thank you. Have a blessed weekend and we'll see you on Monday.